Hello, everyone. Welcome to our panel, The Arts Illustrating the Art of Leading. Uh, we are very, very excited to be uh, having this panel today. Um, you know, for us, as we, everyone here is an artist um, and, and a leader in their own way. So we're very excited to get into this conversation and talk about the ways that, um, you know, arts can have an impact throughout the world in many different ways. Uh, you know, for us, the prompt that we're dealing with is the fact that the most important inducement for artists is the need to do new things, uh, particularly in times of crises, such as the current pandemic. Leaders of business and government, too, have to imagine, see inside the problem, and be innovative to instill their personal vision to lead to higher goals. And the question that we're really dealing with here is, what are the best ways for artists and leaders to visualize these problems to make them emerge as solvable? And um, also, what can leaders learn from artists? So um, here, we are getting some, some beeping in the background from somewhere. I'm not sure where that came from, so sorry about that for anyone who's listening. Um, However, uh, you know, here I would love to start uh, with our activist and artist, Alyssa Meadows, who, uh, who I think is such a great person to kick this off, especially with the, the type of work uh, that you do. So um, Alyssa, can you please uh, introduce yourself and then tackle the prompt? So let us know, um, you know, in your opinion, uh, especially informed by your work, uh, what are the best ways for artists and leaders to visualize problems and make them emerge as solvable? And, um, you know, with that, what can leaders learn from artists? All right, well, I feel a little silly. There's nobody here yet, but I'll, I'll, I'll make it work. <laughs> um, so when I, so I'm a photographer. I, I would say my work predominantly focuses around documentary work um, in some capacity or another, but I focus you know, on women's issues, intersectional feminism, a lot, all activism-based work, essentially. Um, and, and in reflecting on the prompt, there were kind of two main points that I thought I wanted to make, at least in the opening arguments of sorts. Um, which is one thing that, you know, we could all learn from artists is that artists don't talk, we do. Because if we just talk, we're not artists. If I tell you I'm going to paint, and I tell you I'm going to paint, and I tell you I'm going to paint, and I never make the painting, I'm not an artist. You know what I mean? So we inherently have to have a follow through with with what we say we're going to do. And and that speaks to the drive that we have, because we don't stop. We don't, we don't take no for an answer. We don't stop when people tell us they don't like our art or that it's not good. We don't stop when we're told that it's not a good way to make a living. It's something that we just keep going through and continue to make, even though we know it's a tough industry. It's very difficult to make it as an artist because there's so many people that want that path in life. And so the, I, I think one thing people really could take from artists is that we really know how to persevere and follow through based on what we're committed to and what we're passionate about as compared to getting knocked off the horse here or knocked off the horse there. Um, and in the context of the pandemic, I think all of us will probably speak to that in some capacity over, over the course of this discussion. Um, for me, it was when the pandemic happened, um, I will try to screen share. We'll see if it works. Tell me if it, if it doesn't. Chrome tab. Oh. So is that working? Yes. Yeah, we're working. This is great. Thank right. you. Yeah. So, so essentially, let me make it a little wider. So it plays a little. Yeah. So essentially during the pandemic, you know, it, everybody, you know, my work completely evaporated. There was no employment left entirely. So rather than just sitting at home, I went around the country and was documenting all the BLM murals that went up all over the country because I knew it was going to be temporary art that was going to, you know, it, it it does not have longevity the way something in a museum does. These are potentially the only thing that will make this retain once a building gets knocked down or a mural is painted over by another mural. And so, you know, rather than just saying, I don't have enough money to this, <laughs> I don't have the time to do this, I drove all over the country and pretty much just camped in my car and on the road and did this on my own time on several road trips and documented about 50 of the murals. So I think that's, um, that's uh, hmm? I thought something, something said. Alyssa, thank you so much. Um, and, and for those, and so for those who don't know, um, because I don't know if you explicitly said it, but can you just make it clear um, what, what your medium of, of art making oh, is? In your yeah, I'm a photographer predominantly, but I just, I, I work in other mediums as well, but photography is my predominant focus. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. And um, 
Next, I would love to hear from uh, the artist and creative clarity, Haynes. Uh, could you please also tackle uh, the same prompt? You know, what are the best ways for for artists and leaders to to make to visualize problems and make them emerge as solvable? And you know, in the same breath, what can leaders learn from artists? Yeah, um, thank you so much. The reason why I really wanted to be on this panel was because I I, I find myself often. I'm a painter. Um, I find myself often at this kind of crossroads um, with my work um, in which I can't share it freely on social media. Um, I am a queer feminist artist and a lot of LGBT and feminist and women artists, disabled, fat, sex worker, a lot of marginalized artists cannot share um, their work and really, um, really function on Instagram. And we've found ourselves in a situation right now where Instagram is the platform of the art world and all the more so after the pandemic. This is super important and it's something that's just not being looked at across, um, you know, across sort of categories. Politicians, you know, aren't aware of how we have these private corporations that are really shaping the kind of arts being made, shaping what is being made seen, shown in museums and galleries. And I don't know what the solution is. I don't know whether it's legislation. I don't know whether it's some kind of grant so that these companies can actually fund a more sophisticated, um, you know, sort of um, process of going through the material and deciding what is okay to leave on and, and what isn't. But right now the art world is just lost. It's fallen through the cracks and fine art is, is in a really precarious, I think, position due to these oversights and these lack of connections. Um, so I'm really hoping that, you know, I can just kind of throw this out there as a problem that really affects us all ultimately and affects culture and the future of culture. And maybe we can, um, you know, just come up with some possible solutions. And this could also just be seen as an example of a kind of problem um, that is similar to others that um, needs cross fertilization between different areas um, of leadership in order to be solved. Thank you so much. That was that was so well stated, and I think. Um, also speaks to an idea which I think is very is true to artists and um, you know especially artists who are politically active, which is that a, a lot of times it's really about raising the question, right, and, and raising new types of questions um, and making people think. It, and and that's a big part of what artists do too. So I, I really appreciate you for bringing that up early because um, I think sometimes maybe those who who are not very intimate with the creative process, um, I think sometimes maybe that's maybe not as clearly understood that sometimes the artist place is to, to sometimes just um, ask a question. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, next, I would love to speak with um, Humera who, Abid, who is joining us um, from Pakistan. So thank you so much, um, because I know it is very early where you are. So thank you so much. Uh, and of course, you are a visual artist, a mentor, um, and an activist. And uh, so I'm very excited to hear you um, respond to the prompt um, as well. Thank you. Um... From my perspective, I was born in Pakistan. I now live in US and I still have a studio in Pakistan. And growing up, I saw a lot of restrictions and boundaries around. And we were discouraged from talking about so many issues that it became my passion. I realized not talking is not really resolving any issue. Oops. Um... I'm sorry, I was trying to share screen, but um, I guess see? I'm I'm ah. on a slower internet connection. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, when I went to art school, it was against the wishes of my family, and um, I was given all these warnings not to wear sleeveless or smoke. It was considered like you know, it's a stereotype image of a woman who is rebellious or outgoing, and nobody really appreciates that. And I saw a lot of women suffering around me. So I decided to use that in my work. Sorry, well, I can't share the images. I was trying to show you images of how my work represents that. 
and then there is so much more happening in the society we were discouraged from talking about you know even the basic things like sex puberty and even relationships miscarriages all these taboos around us so i decided to use them in my i realized not talking is not resolving any issue and i decided to open up these conversations in my work molestation in um, you know religious places mosques which is also happening in churches and other places um, recent protests um, which actually brought my you know it, which got highlighted during pro, uh, the pandemic time as well and i am trained in miniature and sculpture and these were the two fields considered more like a craft so i decided to use them and push them push the boundaries so i can push them into the contemporary world and do something new there were not many sculptors in pakistan at that time there was hardly any women and i i felt there was a lack of women's voice in some mediums including wood carving and so i decided to bring that into my work and represent these ideas i feel that it's a responsibility of an artist to educate society and um we have the advantage to use aesthetics and beauty and all and bring all these layers of messaging in our work thank you so much oh my gosh now i'm like i'm so sad that we didn't get to see the art but it's okay uh, I, i'm sure that um you know we also we, we we also can look uh look up your art and and do deep dives like for anyone who's watching it people who are going to play this back later so um you know do your googles y'all cuz it it'll definitely be worth it but that's for everyone here but uh very exciting stuff uh Julia Christensen I'm uh, very excited thank you for being here um you're a professor of art at Oberlin College and um and so in similar ways I'm so excited to hear um how, your approach to how you think you know artists and leaders can visualize problems make them solvable and you know like what leaders can learn from from artists yeah Um I come from a a very collaborative process and um I'm an interdisciplinary artist. Uh I work in um I teach electronic media at at Oberlin. Um but my practice uh certainly spans, you know, photography, installation, uh you know, internet, video, etc. um and i'm also a writer i've i've published a couple of books about my projects and um i i think i i generally have what people call a research and practice you know i dig into these kind of um uh long term research projects that spin out into um art projects along the way um and i'm currently uh i'm also the president of an organization called the space song foundation which um is a nonprofit that i founded with um a group of scientists and engineers uh from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory that i started collaborating with a few years ago through a fellowship that i had at LACMA the Los Angeles County Museum of Art in LA and um we started developing ideas around sustainable technology in outer space and and thinking about the um sort of e-waste problem that we have on earth and how that is um you know being basically copied in outer space and um and how uh we can uh develop actual technology that can um you know outlive obsolescence uh in space and um it's been an amazing process to work with uh the scientists and engineers who often say that working with an artist helps them to think through their thinking you know i mean it's like i think um for for engineers and for scientists and and um you know this is probably true of a lot of uh sort of fields of I don't know leadership um you know it having an artist at the table can very often help lead to answers that um you know the the insider might not get to themselves um and I'm always super excited to um you know be an artist at the table having these conversations that are outside of my wheelhouse uh just to um you know expand the way that we think about the world. Oh, so, thank yeah, you. That's basically. 
No, thank you so much. I, there, there's so much that's like, I, yeah, I can't wait to, as we get going because so much, there's so many connections already through so much that has been said. And um, last but certainly not least, uh, I, I am so excited. Um, you know, she, this person just so much fun. We've been having so much fun. But uh, thank you so much for being here, Nancy Kellab. Uh, you are a, a painter and author, the the owner and creator and, and creative director of your own gallery. Um, I, I'm so excited for you to be here. Um, yeah, can you please respond to the prompt? I mean, you heard it a hundred times. You know what it's about. Uh, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you, Mark, and fellow artists. It's been a pleasure to hear about your work, and I'm grateful to be able to share with you today. Um, I'm obsessed with the human condition. For 35 years, I've been creating peoplescapes. They're oil, uh, sculpted sculpture, found objects, computer parts on canvas, addressing social, political, and spiritual issues facing our society. I use juxtaposition and humor to weave together narratives about contemporary society, and I like to highlight the universality and commonality of all of us even though I stress the individuality too. Um, I depict the good, the bad, and the ugly. And unfortunately, during difficult times like now, with raging war and, you know, in, right on TV, we're watching people die. It's, it's unbelievable. Um, it's a very fertile time for me as far as productivity. Now, I started as a plein air painter and have been forced to document global warming through that because... Our environment is changing, for sure. So I consider myself a visual reporter. Now, I have two pictures that I want to share with you. I'm going to share the screen. And they're about democracy, our fight for democracy. This one is called, can you see it? Can you guys see it? Okay. Yeah. Um, this is the spirit of democracy. It's a very large canvas. It's a sculpture, found objects, computer parts, because uh, technology is infiltrating all aspects of our society. And this is about the powers that influence us. And so there will be the church, the state, and the arts or entertainment. I just feel like there's a blurry truth and a fuzzy line between the church and state and entertainment. Right now, news is entertainment. News has to make money, so we don't always get the truth. And depending on, you know, what generation you are, you're getting your news from different sources. And, I, and you know, it's unfortunate that truth is currently negotiable. And, uh, you know, we would hope to find basic truths to connect with. And given social media, you know, we're witnessing the push and pull of evolution. I'm going to share another one. I'm going to stop the share and then share again. Mm -hmm. The second, the second painting is about voting. Is that physical? Mm -hmm. yep. This is called the cliffhanger. And this is oil on canvas. And this is my request, my prayer, that the John Lewis Voting Rights Act gets passed. And, you know, the U U.S. democracy is at, at stake. We're extremely vulnerable and fragile right now. And, you know, just the fact that even science has been politicized in reaction to COVID. We've seen what uh, the schism has done to our society. And I just feel like, you know, without basic truth, people are free to conjure up their own realities. And it's just so destructive to the fabric of our union, you know. And the true cliffhanger is, will democracy survive? And I feel like what leaders can learn from artists is that artists use the right side of the brain. It's creativity, it's intuition, um, it's thinking outside the box. It's, you know, what leaders and artists share is, is the need to have communication and vision. And without either one of those, you know, we fall flat. And I just feel like um, we also need to have sustainability. And in that, you know, artists are extremely disciplined. We have passion. We stick with our program. We've probably been doing it for years without much, you know, without attention sometimes. And I feel like, you know, working deeply inside out uh, and, and taking humanity into consideration, compassion and empathy, we can, um, you know, make decisions based on what's best for the general public, you know, base for humankind. So that's my statement, and I'm sticking to it. 
<laughs> thank you, thank you. Such a such a powerful and beautiful statement. So, the you know from hearing hearing from all of you respond to the prompt, there are several things that um, that I think all of us are are dealing with in different ways, right? We're we're, we're talking about democracy, right? Whether it's the ways that you know democracy is playing out. And, you know, big, big D democracy, like in our government or, you know, like in, in the ways that the social social media companies and, and platforms are able to um, quite literally influence our, our social media, but also influence, uh, I mean, influence our democracy, but also influence the um, who's able to speak and whose ideas are, are, are valuable. Um, and, you know, the, the interesting thing is over the last few years, we, we've been dealing with a pandemic, but we've also been dealing with, um, a, a, in part because of the pandemic, we've been dealing with all of these social ideas um, have been heightened, right? So, so places where um, women were were, were treated uh, with with inequity, uh, in a lot of ways that treatment has become worse, right? Or racial inequities. I mean, th there's so many ways where it just seems like the the divides between our society, the the the, the confusion and and, and and democracy, all of these things are, are on high end levels. Um, but one of the groups of people that that has really fought, try to sustain and, and fight through that um, are artists, right? And 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 I think a, a lot of that is this group here is just being resilient. And 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 so I would love to to. I would love to ask all of you about this, and and I'll, I'll sort of just like uh, cherry pick because I think so much of of, of what we can um, can address is is here and also is is relevant to so much of I think people who will listen to this. So, can you talk about the ways that like over the last let's say two years in, in particular? So like let's say since you know 2020, the ways that you've had to adjust to a lot of the changes that have happened in society. Um, and 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 the, the ways like the issues that have come up for you, and then the ways that that you have um, overcome those issues, or the ways that you might be working through them now. Um, so I'd like to start off with with Alyssa, if that's okay. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, just please, I would love to hear your thoughts there. Um, well, I think in in terms of how to adapt and and still make art and be resilient in the last two years, I think it was really what are we able to do? Because at least for me, with my art, one of my like founding, like foundational projects is is called Every Woman I Know, where I'm documenting all the women I personally know that are survivors of sexual violence. Now, some of those women are here in New York with me, and I did about 30 women here, but I had 15 women across the country that have wanted to participate for years that have just not been in close enough proximity. So when the pandemic happened, instead of being like, well, I'm just going to hide in my bunker apartment and just box in, it was, wait, this is the perfect time because I'm never going to have work be so slow on a professional, like paid sense that I can take the time and go to all the women rather than try to get them to come to me. And maybe it takes five or 10 years for us to get their portrait done. I can go to them and get it done. And I'll just be on the, I'll camp, I'll sleep in my car. I won't, I won't contribute to the problem, but I'll still make sure that I'm getting my personal work done if I'm not able to, you know, do commercial work right now. And so that was kind of the approach I used. And it, it ended up being my most productive year as an artist because I was just focused on making my art. So that's my initial response. That's really, <laughs> no, that's really powerful. I mean, and, and I mean, no, and, and I think that there's, a, I mean, I think that there's a, there's a lot of, of artists and creatives who, who can identify with that, right? Sort of being like, whoa, all of my commercial work is slowing down how can I use this opportunity to maybe do something that, that take advantage of this and, and make that creative project that I've been thinking about for, for a long time. Um, Humira, as an artist who is, who is crossing international boundaries, I mean, I, I it just, just with the way things have gone lately and, and just, just so much has happened politically. I, I would love to hear just even like how, how you've managed these last few years. Um, I mean, it's, I think I will agree with, you know, what we just discussed uh, that, you know, I have two studios. I'm a sculptor and painter and I have two studios, one for clean work and one is at home. That's how it works for me. And the, my workshop is at a different location. So somehow uh, this pandemic helped me focus on my work even more. And I was able to focus on issues and even connect with, you know, people and friends who might be across the world. But I think at this time, the virtual world became closer. We had talks. I have to give talks. And 
we brought that platform online so many friends who were in different parts of the world could join as well so i think along with all these challenges there were some advantages as well and we figured out a way to make it work and then all the issues which were happening we found a way to highlight them and then use them in our work and then use the virtual virtual platform to share with each other and all the ideas and i think i also feel community family and friends became very important in this time because we re we realized the importance of community you know, at this time when we were isolated especially in the beginning totally totally and and nancy uh same for you especially as someone who whose art is is so deeply about about people yeah uh right before the pandemic came i was exhibiting a lot and i was in, involved with the community and i was um really out in the world dealing with people all the time and then the pandemic hit and um i was became ecstatic <laughs> it was a relief for me to be able to just cocoon myself into my creativity and which exploded like like Alyssa during that time i i, I just be, became so creative the last couple of years on multiple fronts and also i realized i didn't need that much attention from the outside world you know as artists we tend to have to have an ego and you have to promote yourself and strut your stuff and convince people that you're great you know quote unquote and i felt so liberated by not having to play any of those games and not care about the outside world so in a way uh, it's deepened my it, it's deepened my creativity it's made me appreciate the relationships i have um it's simplified my life i think when you take away all some of the noise of the outside world you hear your inner voice and i'm you know i live by intuition i i always feel like we've been given our heart as our guide and we should fall into our heart and i felt like i i the last few years i had the chance to do that um i i i live by three mottos you know i do what i can to be creative every day i do something to prevent catastrophe in the future and i serve when i can and so my life is simplified into those three categories and um there's been an enrichment about it you know I, of course i don't want people to be su suffering and now that we're you were loosening up the binds and we were able to interact more i missed my friends and my family of course but i just think you know it's 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 like a meditation to have to sit with yourself and take away the external um ordeal you know um so in that way my work has been enriched by it and it's also because i do address uh social political issues i never felt alienated because i'm so inside the work that is all about people and did and i did pivot to you know um to digital um through zooms and i i've been involved in a lot of uh, art shows online i actually won a couple of awards and i was awarded online which was very strange cuz ordinarily you do it in person um and hopefully we'll all meet at some point we'll be able to uh, be at this forum again uh in person so yeah For i guess sure. it's making making lemonade out of lemons right Yeah, yeah, I, and and um you know it's interesting because so many people so many people have said that to me they, they're like you know our artists were you know maybe more so than than other you know professions kind of kind of prepared for this because our our conditions are are never ideal, right? And so like whatever that means for better or for worse that there there's a way where you know the the degree to as much things change maybe didn't impact artists as much as as other people because um our situation was already precarious to to begin with. So. And also we're used to being alone, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. One man bands. <laughs> Yeah. yeah yeah um julia christensen i would love to love to hear from you uh, uh you about this uh as well yeah it's interesting to hear the hear the, the responses i had a slightly different uh experience in part because i'm a professor at a college and chair of a department and i'm also the convener of the practicing arts uh division at at Oberlin College so um you know i kind of was dealing with chaos um you know on a zillion levels and um it was in no way a return to you know a creative space for me it was like um you know became very um sort of 
um, hyper speed, putting out fires, you know, uh, crazy for a couple of years. And I also had a large solo show that, you know, um, was the culmination of like a decade of work with lots of institutional support that in, was installed the week before the pandemic hit. And so it never opened mm -hmm. and sat in an empty gallery for 14 oh. months. And I also um, had a book launch uh, right, you know, during during the pandemic, which also, you know, had like a decade lead up, you know. So in a way, I kind of had this experience of, I finally found the metaphor for kind of like getting on a plane for a big trip that I had been planning for years and then just like never getting off the plane, you know, and um and so I had this experience of um, not having a certain resolution I expected with um, part of my creative process, uh, you know, which was just something that I had to learn to work through, um, not being able to see the show or have a book talk or sign a book, you know, um, after, after a launch. Um, and then meanwhile, you know, I, I have two small children and they were home and I was chairing my department and, um, you know, it was crazy. It is crazy. It's, you know, I mean, we're safe and, you know, I'm so grateful for, for all of that. Uh, I, I, I guess I don't, I don't really have a life where I feel like I'm, I'm a solo. I'm I'm like involved with so many conversations with so many people all the time. So um, it was a lot of managing. Um, but I will say I, I've heard everyone use the word pivot, and um, you know, pivoting has become a way of life over the last couple of years. And um, I have found that again, being the artist in the room, you know, uh, being the chair of the art department, sitting with chairs of, uh, you know departments where maybe the pedagogy isn't quite as expansive as it is in street art, uh, I find that we've been able to pivot um, swiftly and creatively uh, at a sort of level of um, fluidity and comfort that, uh, you know, has been surprising for me. You know, we, we do something like this all the time you know uh so so yeah i mean that has been um you know an important thing uh to to experience but it's been a lot of ups and downs yeah and and thank you because that's i mean that's so real and i actually i really thank you for for being so uh honest about that experience and like transparent about it um, because also the parenting is, is, is very real for a lot of people too. I think in the midst of being a professional being a, and being an artist. So it's like all of that. And then took us a lot. So yeah, thank you for, for highlighting that as well. Um, and, uh, clarity, I would also love for you to just talk about like the last few years too, and like the challenges that, that you faced and, and how you sort of worked through them and stuff like that. Sure. I, I love that you're you're asking people to focus on like the positives of what we've done, because I think that often we, we don't do that um, or we forget to do that. Um, just just continuing to kind of use the lens of looking at uh, social media censorship and, you know, how that's been something that's been a problem that I've worked with. Um, I've had some opportunity like I took an opportunity to write about my experience and hyper allergic in like 2018 and from that I met other artists who had the same problem and since then there have been a lot more articles and um, I was um, asked to write an opinion piece for Art News which I did um, and I also like speak up on social media like not just about my own work but when I'm posting someone else's work like recently I posted Joan Semmel's work she had a retrospective, you know, she's almost 90. Um, and I had all these great pit photographs from it. And um, same thing happened with Laura Aguilar, the photographer. Um, it just really just, it, it enrages me that these already marginalized artists who have waited like way too long to have recognition 
are literally not able to be seen on the main platform that the entire art world uses. This has economic consequences. It has historic consequences. It has so many consequences. So anyway, I, I, um, I always make a stink on social media and I share and I ask people to complain to Instagram and I ex explain how to do that. Um, also, when an artist I know, Betty Tompkins, got um, lost her account, like I, I sort of organized an online sort of support and, you know, in support of her and eventually she got it back. We, you know, mass complaining helps. Um, so I think just kind of the power in numbers thing, you know, and I just I would like to get this issue out beyond um, the circles that I'm in. Um, into, you know, wider circles. Um, and I guess I'll just keep on trying to do that however <laughs> however I can. But I think writing has been a good tool for sure. Um, Claire, I have a question. Do, do you feel like th that the mobilization of people on social media is uh, is easier now than let's say it was in 2019 or, or is it harder? Um, well, they... Instagram has had some changes. They've 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 enabled this this new thing where everybody automatically has certain controls put on their account, um, and you have to actually change your settings so that you you have more open um, content coming through. A lot. Of, so I think, but that hasn't actually changed the amount of censorship that happens. So I haven't actually seen much change, to be honest, even though they had this big meeting with artists um, at Instagram headquarters at one point. Basically, now what's happened is that certain artists have, an, have a friend at Instagram that they can call if they have a problem with their account, That so, so which is really ridiculous because that doesn't help the vast majority of people no. who, <laughs> you know, so anyway, yeah. Ah, I got it. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. You. Um, one of the, so, you know, we, we, really only have a few minutes but one thing that i wanted to hear um all of you touch on and and i think what i'll do is maybe ask you to touch on this and then also if you need to segue that into like any last burning words that that you have just to make sure you get those out um and you know the thing that i want to talk about is art and empathy um and you know um i i think that um a, a lot of art making deals with empathy, I think, at its base um, and, and, and at its core. And so um, I'm, I'm just going to sort of go in the in the order that, that's on my screen uh, next to me. So I would love, um, um, yeah, like uh, Nancy, if, if you don't mind, um, I would love for you to, to sort of tackle um, that topic, uh, if, if it's OK, if, if you feel ready to yeah, jump in. Yeah, it's fine. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I as I said before, just empathy and compassion is a huge part. And, and I know when I create my people escapes, every, every character has a face. I think about what their history is. Are they a black person who suffered? Are they someone who's had discrimination? Are they a gay person who's been discriminated against? I, I make a story behind that. And I just think that artists, always, we're always prepared for the uncertainty of the future. Our artists are very resilient. We have to conform to the times. And I know that that's part of having empathy is being able to rise again and to, um, you know, and feel others pain and, and make decisions like from the heart and from your intuition, from your feeling, from your whole brain, take everything into account. And I just wanted to say um, Oscar Wilde in, in 1889, he said that life imitates art more than art imitates life. And he meant that life is always searching for expression and art already is. And so in that way, um, when you when we take in other people's work and we absorb it, it awakens feelings and and sometimes um, uh, brings uh, a point of view that is a, from a grander perspective of, of our own. And that opens you up and it allows you to feel what another might feel. And I think we need more of that in our life right now. I mean, like I said, watching war on TV is just so incredible, dev incredibly devastating. And I, I feel helpless. And the only thing I could do is turn to my art and turn to my creativity and work from inside out to help make this a better world in whatever way that I can, any positivity I can communicate. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um Humira, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well on, on art and empathy. Well, I would say art should comfort the disturbed. 
and disturb the comfortable. And this has been the purpose of my work. If we are not addressing more than just issues, you know, um, it doesn't have to be that we have to personally go through them. If we are affected by them, even if it's in the other part of the world and they don't, they don't have the voice, it's our responsibility as artists to educate society. And I think this is what leaders can learn from artists to be, you know, persistent, to focus on issues which might otherwise be difficult to talk about and present solutions of them. So I'm, I'm going to try to screen share one more time if I am successful. <laughs> no, ah. it just is not happening. Oh, no. Anyways, no. I mean, no. I have uh, my, my parents were refugees and I'm an immigrant. And there are so many things and immigration and refugee crisis is very real right now. And nobody is really talking about them. There was one thing which I feel is a little disadvantage of COVID is it took highlight from some other real issues and took us away from it. And everybody was focused on uh, this pandemic a little bit more. And I kept thinking at that time, what's happening all these in detention centers in refugee centers when people are moving Nobody was talking about them. And if you know, in last few years, this issue has been increased and spread to other parts of the world. So I have been trying to use that in my work. We are talking about war and I have, um, that's also another issue that I have used in my work along with, you know, all the issues that women are facing or kids are facing or refugees are facing. So I think uh, empathy for me is really, really important. There is no community without it. And if, we are not doing more than just addressing these issues. I feel that, you know, um, it's not enough. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, Clarity, I would love to hear your thoughts on, on art and, and empathy and how that plays a role in, in, in what you do. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, it's funny. Empathy, I think, is a feminized word. Um, and it has been it's been out of fashion for many years, and I think only recently, in the past five years, people are starting to talk about care, and they're talking about care a lot. And I think it's kind of a new generation, actually, of artists who are um, just not like um, there was. I think that like for a long time, I remember seeing. Um, Linda Nochlin say that she hated the word empathy because I don't know, she just thought it was like if a woman artist was described as ha having empathy, it was somehow like not strong enough or something. But she came from an, a, you know, a different generation. And I think I'm really excited that now um, that people are talking about care and empathy and even the word therapy is sometimes used. You'll hear people saying, yeah, I, the, my, my work is very therapeutic. And that was just a no-no like 15 <laughs> years ago, you know, because then if, if it's therapy, it can't be art, you know? Um, so I w I've always been inspired by Jo Spence, um, who she had, she created something called phototherapy, which was literally photography and portraiture that was considered to be literally therapeutic um, for her and for her partner. Um, and she made it, intellectual and interesting and unapologetic. So, um, I mean, I've always been really interested in my relationships with my models because I, I do different kinds of portraiture. Um, and it's been a lot about empathy and healing and healing from trauma um, and celebration of, of kind of the vulnerable parts of the self. And, um, and it's just wonderful that the landscape that, we're, that I'm in now is one that can hear that and doesn't think, oh, you're not really an artist. You're just like an art therapist or something, you know? Oh, wow. Thank you for saying that. Cause I, you know, I had no idea of that contextualization. So I just learned a lot and it's, it's so powerful to learn and, and just know how these things shift. Right. And also just to like, be aware of like my language, because I would hate for someone to see like me talking to like, a, you know, a panel full of, of, of women and like using a term that like, historically has a different meaning. I mean, and, and it's all important. I think not that my context, I think, would be misunderstood here. But I don't know, that's that's just like really powerful and like important to understand that, right? Because I, historically, like 
Black artists have had to deal with the connotation of certain terms um, and have changed those terms to mean a positive. So um, I also think this is something that marginalized people tend to do and, and it's powerful when you see that reflected. So, so yeah, so thank you for that. Um, uh, yes, Julia, I would love to hear from you, please, um, art and, and empathy. Yeah, I'll just um, say quickly, I know we're over time now, but, um, you know, for me, since I do make work usually, you know, in a community um, with with people, and I also teach in a community um, that, uh, you know, really values the, the sense of... Um, of working together and yes, taking care of each other. Um, uh, for me, the art making process is just sort of um, inherently about that uh, communication and uh, yeah, it, it's community. And uh, for me that uh, infers empathy and um, a sort of, you know, connection to each other. So, no, yeah, yeah, empathy. <laughs> yes, no, thank you, thank you, much appreciated. And um, Alyssa, last but not least, uh, please, please close <laughs> out with your thoughts here. Oh, sure, no problem. And I'm, I'm glad because I feel like my approach is going to be tangentially, like just a little off. Because I love what everybody said, but nobody really spoke about self empathy. And I think that's something that a lot of artists have to do in their work because we're so vulnerable, we're so honest, we tell ones on ourselves, we we show our dirty laundry, we talk about the good, the bad, the ugly, like, like Nancy said before, <laughs> like, it's, it's, we go those places. And so we have to have self empathy, in order to do that, because we have to, we have to not beat our past selves up in order to have those conversations. And I think that also, like, at least in my work, that translates to in, in every woman I know, because I tell them, like when I do that project and I'm shooting, I share my story first with whoever I'm shooting with and I tell them they can tell me everything, they can tell me nothing. It's whatever they wanna share and get out that they give and I'm gonna go take it away with me and you know, get it out of their space as much as I can, let it get off their chest. But I don't think if I, if I didn't have the self-empathy for my own experiences to share with them, I don't think I would get the same communications back because we have very honest, raw, vulnerable communications in that space. And it's resulted in, in getting the good pictures I've gotten. So I think everybody can benefit from, I think that's kind of what um, Clarity was pointing to a little bit with the, the new wave of artists. I think a lot of that self-empathy is what she was kind of speaking to there. So that's a, that's my bit. <laughs> Oh my gosh, well, that was like that was like the perfect way to end that. So thank you all so much. Thank you all so much for being here. I know we're over time. All of you were so insightful and just just thank you so much. Um, this has been recorded. It is streaming now, so it'll be available immediately after. So please feel free to share it. If you watched it and you got to the end, definitely share it. Please, there's so much amazing thoughts that were shared here tonight that um, the world should hear this and know. So thank you all. Uh, thank I'm you, Mark. Uh, much appreciated. Thank you so much. It was great to hear everybody. And all thank you, ladies. everybody. Nice to meet you.